Um, so yes, the uh, surveys that I'll be um, showing you this evening form part of this retrospective um, on CCMI's work over the past two decades. And we're using them to direct our future research over the next 20 years. So to make our comparison as accurate as possible with what we did in 1999, we visited the same 25 sites at the same time of year to reduce seasonal differences and use the exact same methodology. And just to go over that, to give you an idea of what we did, we had two teams. We had three divers surveying the benthos here. So that's everything that sort of grows and attached to the ground. And then we had another two divers counting fish. So the coral team, the benthic team, would lay out a 10 meter transect um, along the reef. So the first thing that they do is count the number of centimeters directly below that 10 meter tape that the reef is occupied by living reef building, so the stony corals. Then, well, we use that actually to calculate percent cover, which is a, a universal metric for um, understanding reef health, and we'll be talking about that. They then measure the corals in that 10 meter distance, getting um, <coughs> width and height, and also an assessment of their health. So they're looking for things like the presence of diseases, recent or old mortality, any signs of stress from bleaching high temperatures, um, scars from grazing, presence of damselfish gardens, all of these things. So they build up a pretty comprehensive idea of the health of the corals, and from that we can understand the health of the reef. They also make records of the coverage of the other substrates in the area and count the number of recruits, which are corals less than two centimeters in size. The idea being then that you repeat these surveys um, at the same time of year so that you get an idea of how reef health and recruitment might be changing over time. So while they're doing that, the fishy people swim a 30 meter corridor, um, 30 by two meters really, that extends up to the water's surface, counting all the fish in that area um, to species level and estimating size to within 10 centimeter categories. And this is pretty important because it gives us an understanding of the size structure in the population and the age. So, we need to know about this um, size distribution to understand what's going on with the reef. Uh, for example, um, if we have a, a lack of the larger fish, we would look for other signs of uh, fishing pressure. Um, or if we see that there are too many small fish uh, missing, then that might indicate uh, a lot of lionfish on the reef. And so that's important to know. But then also we want to know whether the populations of these species are able to sustain themselves. So they become sexually mature at a certain size. And so we need to know if there are enough individuals of those sizes to be able to support the, well, the next generation. And also, the impact that a fish has both on the reef and in the population in terms of feeding and reproduction um, varies with its size. Um, the larger individuals are disproportionately more important in those roles. So it's not like a case of 10 100, centimeter, uh, 10 100 gram fish is the same impact as one kilogram fish. You do want the larger fish. So this is all important information to know. So the first metric I would like to talk to you about is that of percent cover. So that's the number of centimeters in that 10 meters that the reef has live reef building corals. Like I said, it's used worldwide. People who deal in coral will ask about this, what's your coral cover? You know, it's a, it's a, it's a universal currency. And um, it's used to compare reefs of, well, yes, around the world of, from different systems. And of course, also over time, which is um, what we're doing here. 
While we're here, please have a look and note all the structure in this video on this reef and also the number of fish because I'm going to show you a comparison um, in a minute. It's from the brack. Mm. Yeah. Um, gorgeous. I'll just leave it up and you can enjoy it for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> I won't tell you where. I'm keeping the site to myself. <laughs> so what um, percent coral cover implies is that the reef is self-sustaining. Another buzzword that you'll hear is resilient. Of course, the coral, it's the corals that produce the limestone. And so the more corals that you have on the reef, the better able the reef is to grow and, well, also to maintain itself. So the Healthy Reefs Initiative has come up with these categories for coral cover. The best being in blue, which is scientifically determined to be very good, um, over 30%, good being uh, from 30 down to 20, and then you've got yellow, orange, poor and critical in red, 5% and below. So let me show you, well, this is what we've based our assessment on. It's a very handy um, scale um, and is used around the Caribbean. Here are the sites that we visited. So if you know any of them, um, or you know the areas, have a guess about what you think the percent coral cover is at that reef, and then you can see how that compares with what we found last year. You can guess um, a number, but I think a color would probably be easier. So this is what we found in 1999. Grand Cayman is good. <laughs> Um, the average coral cover of the island was 21%. And this is what we found last year. The symbols are now squares. And average coral cover has declined to 15%. So do these colors match with what you were estimating? Some nods, yes, yes, yes. pretty much. Mm. Excellent. Um, so we did it right then. <laughs> Um, so this is the uh, story for Grand Cayman, but it also actually is the same pattern that we see across the country. This was 1999 for all three islands, and you'll see that the best coverage is the west side of Little Cayman, and the worst is the west side of the Brac. And what's interesting is actually in 2018, that seems to still be the case, just the numbers are a bit lower. And so the average uh, for the country as a whole has declined from 21% in 99, which is the same as what Grand Cayman had, down to 17% overall. So to combine these, here is maybe something that's slightly easier to read. And what these percentages are, are the proportion of reefs in these categories for that year. And what you'll see is that the um, good and very good have declined and the fair and poor have increased. So this is concerning, um, but it is also what we've seen across the region where the Caribbean average in 2015 was 18%. And so we're now at 17% in 2018. Now, I told you it was a comparable metric, right? So that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to compare. <laughs> um, this is in uh, alphabetical order if you're looking for a particular country. These are the most recent results that I could find. And so the year that um, it was published and the coral cover is up there. And so um, you'll see the, if you're planning a dive holiday, take note. Um, the best seems to be the Dominican Republic and Guatemala at around 30%. We are similar to the Bahamas, Belize, and Puerto Rico. And we are doing far better than Jamaica and the Florida Keys, which has 4%. So, uh, yes, a bit concerning, but we do see these patterns across the region. Um, but now, hang on, sorry, I'm kind of dry.
as I'm sure you're thinking, percent cover in itself doesn't tell the whole story. It's a convenient metric and it, it doesn't matter you know, what, where you are and what the species are, but it isn't everything, right? As I'm sure you would understand that several small corals will give exactly the same percent cover as one large one. And so we also need information on both coral size and coral species to get a better idea of how the reef is functioning as an ecosystem. So remember the last video with loads of structure and loads of fish? So here's the comparison, far less structure and far fewer fish. Um, there are two barracuda in a minute and it's kind of a big deal. Oh, there they are. Yeah. Um, this was a fish transect that uh, Kelly was doing and I imagine she found it a pretty easy one. Nothing too challenging there. So what coral size helps explain is firstly, how um, able the reef is to provide habitat for its inhabitants, the fish, the lobsters, the, the crabs, etc., etc. Obviously, a Goliath grouper-sized inhabitant needs a Goliath grouper-sized hiding place, right? And so while you may see fish of those sizes passing through a landscape like this, you know, they can't set up home here. There's, there's nowhere that can house them. Um, these corals are too small to form a structure uh, that would support a, a fish of that size. What, so what coral, what coral size also helps explain is the structural integrity of the reef and how able it is to protect the shoreline from um, wave erosion and oncoming storms. And coral species ties in with this because bolder corals can grow larger and they do a better job of buffering that energy than corals that grow as plates, you know, right, right along the, uh, the sea floor can do. So um, what happened in the Cayman Islands since 1999? Well, the diameter of these circles um, represents the average colony size for the three islands um, in 1999 and 2018. We have the percentage change as a function of the original size and also the average size in 2018. Now, last year, half of all the corals we surveyed were these, one of these three species. And they are reported to grow to about 90, about 60, and about 180 centimeters. Now, for scale, I am 180 centimeters. And this is my wingspan here, representative on this side too. So that's quite a big coral, right? Now, if the average coral size in the Cayman Islands is less than 40%, something like this, then that suggests that either there's a high turnover of individuals, and these are young ones, so there's high mortality on the reef, or that the corals just aren't growing because conditions are suboptimal. Either way, it's not great. And what this reduced coral size and um, coral cover tell us is that the reef has a reduced ability both to function as an ecosystem and to protect the islands from storms than what it did two decades ago. Now, a recent report valued that storm protection uh, from the reef at $5 million every year, and that's for Grand Cayman alone. Uh, the revenue generated by tourism from the marine environment at $69 million, and the reef also supports a fishery worth $2.3 million. So any reduction in these three services that the reef provides could have negative consequences for the whole country in terms of the revenue it can generate, as well as the infrastructure on the islands and the people who live here. Um, Disease prevalence is down. So what this axis is, is the percentage of colonies that were observed with some disease. And then we've got the three islands in 99 and 2018, and the different colors represent the different diseases. So quite clear decline on two of the, the islands. And actually, the difference would be greater than this because they didn't record dark spot, which is this one here. 
the one in grey in 1999. So actually, these columns would be a bit higher than what this graph shows. So this is great news. Um, of the uh, diseases that were the same, we see a clear uh, decline in the white one, which is white band, and in black band, which I imaginatively colored in black. And there's remarkably little red band and yellow band. And this is especially great in that even just last year, there were um, reports of a disease tracking down the Florida Keys, and we've had other outbreaks in the Caribbean um, in recent years. So the fact that they either haven't arrived in the Cayman Islands yet, or haven't had that much of an impact is fabulous. And <coughs> fingers crossed, that's what we see uh, for the next few years as well. Now, the last uh, reef measure I want to talk to you about is seaweed. Now, this is quite a problem because it, uh, seaweed has a, a negative impact both on corals on an individual level as well as the reef um, as a whole. Corals growing in contact with seaweed survive less, grow less, reproduce less, are more likely to um, get diseased. And also, if there's too much seaweed on the reef, then the coral larvae, the, the tiny babies coming back to the reef, um, are put off by the smell. And so you kind of lose that um, next generation if the, if the reef is too high um, with seaweed. So it's an important metric to measure. Um, and last time, we were talking about the percentage of the reef covered in coral. So this is now the percentage of the reef covered in seaweed, the term being um, macroalgal cover. And the Healthy Reefs Initiative has come up with these categories uh, for, for the seaweed. Same colors as before, very good, being in blue, with only 1% macroalgae. You won't find a reef in the Caribbean with only 1%. <laughs> Unfortunately, not anymore. Goods in green, then we go to fair, poor, 50% of the reef. So that's half of the reef covered with seaweed. And critical, over 60%. So this is what we had in 1999. Half of the reefs were poor. And this is what we have in 2018. Almost two-thirds of the reefs are critical, and there's no longer any reefs in good condition. So, yeah, we've got time. I'll show you the, the site breakdown. Why not? Um, this is in 99. The highest coverage was on the BRAC, and if anything, the best was the east side of Grand Cayman, but it's not exactly a clear pattern. Um, and then in 2018, there's, well, there's a lot, a lot of red. And this is bad news because the seaweed directly jeopardizes the potential for recovery for the reefs um, and their future. But I want to end on some more good news. And I reckon this is going to pile volume as well. Yeah. So strange. So the last metrics I'll, I'll show you are of fish density and fish size. Um, so this is important, like I mentioned earlier, because it tells you about the ability of the population to sustain itself. Um, but it's also important because it tells us about the other stressors on the reef. So the level of human impact um, and the um, fish density and size tells us about how able the reef is to provide habitat and provide food for the people who rely on it. It's also important to know about your herbivore populations because of, well, the job they do in eating that pesky seaweed and giving the reef, well, the best conditions. So, um, yeah, so these are pretty important measures to, uh, to know about. The good news is that total fish density on each island is unchanged since 1999. And the average size is either the same or has increased for almost all families of fish. When we look at the most common 
fish families. We've got density here, normally per 100 meters squared. And again, the three islands at the different years, each of the different colors representing a different um, family. And so on Grand Cayman and on the BRAC, there are um, no significant declines for any of these families. There are on Little, significantly so for the grouper in red, um, quite a clear decline there, but also an increase in, in size. And um, there's a noticeable decline for the grunt, but this wasn't statistically significant. So I want to do more analyses on this and look at the species composition of these families and see what's going on there. But this is what we have so far. Now, the data, especially for Grand Cayman, is particularly noteworthy when you consider that the human population in this time has increased by half again. So in 1999, um, the human population was 39,000. And in 2018, it's 63,000, the majority of whom, of course, live on Grand Cayman. So it's really great to see that this, this jump in human presence on the island has not translated into an equivalent jump in human pressure on the reef. What it also tells us is that the reef's ability to provide habitat for these populations is more or less the same as what it was 20 years ago. Um, uh, although, <laughs> whether it's limiting the potential for any future fish population growth remains to be seen. Um, and then the other thing that this tells me is that this increase in seaweed that we've seen on the reef has not come as a result of a decline in herbivore populations. It's probably because of the loss of coral and reef organisms that have freed space in the reef that the seaweed now occupies and has grown in and probably overwhelms the ability of the, well, it does <laughs> overwhelm the ability of the fish to consume it. So in summary then, our data show a decline in coral cover and coral size. On Grand Cayman, that's from 21 to 15% but this is in keeping with the regional declines. We've also seen a decline in coral disease, which is great news, but a very noticeable increase in macroalgal cover, which in, on Grand Cayman is from 34 to 57%. And then... That's the red algae that's on That's the seaweed, sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just macroalgae is the nerdy term and I, I can't always turn it off. <laughs> And then um, fish density and length, mostly unchanged, some increases in size, so, which is really great. Now, this decline on Grand Cayman is concerning um, because like I said, we get um, well, three serious benefits from the reef. It's responsible for $69 million in, in tourism. Um, the, it supports a fishery worth $2.3 million, and it's also responsible for the protection of $5 million of infrastructure on the island. So a loss in these services could um, detrimentally impact the revenue the country is able to generate, as well as people's livelihoods. So what caused it? And it seems like such an easy question. Um, and I wish it had an easy, well, it does have an easy answer. It's a combination of things. <laughs> That's the easy answer. Mm. So we talk about um, global stressors, which as, the, oh, sorry, no, wait. <laughs> as the name implies, spoiler, um, affect the whole planet. Increasing temperatures being a huge one of those, potentially also ocean acidification. Okay, now I'll show you the graph. You, you were looking forward to it. So this is just from 1985, really. Now, the dashed line is sea temperature, the entire global sea, and it's on this axis here. And then specifically the Caribbean is the solid line on that axis over there. So it's about half a degree just since the 80s. Um, 
It's been a full degrees Celsius in the last 140 years. And so that rate, unfortunately, seems to be increasing. So I know, like, you're thinking, hey, I dive in 26 degrees, I dive in 27. I don't tell the difference. I need a wetsuit, right? Well, if you live here, hey. <laughs> um, but actually, it's a massive amount. If you, the medics in the room can help me out here, but if your body temperature increases from 37 to 38, there's something seriously wrong. I mean, you're not dead, but you are, are far from well. And it's the same with the corals. The temperature um, increase directly affects them because corals operate very close to their thermal maximum threshold. So any increase in that sort of average temperature is going to push them over that limit that they're able to deal with more frequently and for longer periods. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing more frequent bleaching events and they're lasting longer. So there's that direct impact of the temperature on the corals, but then there's also that sort of knock-on effect in that the increasing sea temperatures are causing more severe hurricanes, and that is producing, obviously, lots of damage to the reef. So this is a major concern. And then on top of that, we have local stressors, which range from lionfish, too much seaweed, um, marine debris overfishing, and other things that you will know about in the areas where you dive. And so what I think is happening in the Cayman Islands is that it will depend on where you are, which of these factors are most at play. Um, for example, uh, Distance from a boat ramp might explain why one site is more impacted by um, anchor damage, fishing, diver damage than another site. Um, sites near places that are frequently dredged might be more impacted by sedimentation than others. Um, if we look at this map again, depending on the direction of the hurricane, some sites are going to be more um, impacted. And what I think we're seeing here is perhaps that the south of Little Cayman is maybe receiving more of that deep, cool water, and so is perhaps a bit more protected from um, any temperature rise. Now, I am speculating there, absolutely. <laughs> don't quote me, I don't know. But I would imagine that that's because that's where there's been very little change. So it is a guess, but my point is, is that there are both global and local factors at play here, and the relative influence or impact of them will vary with location. And you will know about your sites, I'm absolutely sure, when you go out on the boat. So it isn't a totally simple answer. Now, just looking at this table again, just for some comparison, yes, reef health in the Cayman Islands has declined since 1999. I mean, it could be a lot worse, Florida with 4%, but it could also be a lot better, Guatemala there. Um, we are at risk of losing our reefs, but they're not lost yet. And so we do need to do everything we can to give them the best conditions and the best chance of persisting so we don't end up in a position like Jamaica or the Florida Keys. So what can we do? Well, really, we need more coral and we need it to grow. <laughs> so that comes down to reducing damage on the reef. And now I'm including this uh, photo here because this is a plastic bag that got wrapped around the Elkhorn. And when I cut it off, all of those coral polyps underneath it were totally dead. They were white, there was no flesh left on them at all. It was just skeleton. Um, obviously, they hadn't had access to the sun and so had starved to death. But what's even more sad is that those growing next to plastic were, are also impacted. There's some research that's come out that shows plastics reduce the growth and the reproduction of corals, um, even if they're not, you know, smothering them. So marine debris, especially plastics, are an issue for corals as well as loads of other marine life, all other marine life. 
So we've got reducing damage on one hand, and then we've got protecting and building the reef on the other. And this encompasses all sorts of actions from things quite simply as being careful where you throw your anchor and getting your buoyancy right to not building infrastructure that's going to either directly damage the reef or produce lots of sediment that will wash onto the reef and smother it. Supporting the MPAs and the rules of the area that you're in when you're fishing, leaving the herbivores on the reef so that they can do their job. Um, recycling, reducing your use of plastic. Get involved in coral restoration. And you can do that as an individual, as a hotel, as a business, as the government. Same goes for reducing your carbon footprint. You can do that as an individual, as a business, as a hotel, at, at the government level too. That's a big one. Protect your mangroves and seagrasses. Now, they have a really large part to play in the health of the reef. They, um, it is all connected really, but they absorb a lot of pollution and nutrients that come from onshore. Um, they also cause a lot of sediment to settle, so protecting all of those things from reaching the reef. If you go through the mangroves, you'll see it's like a sieve. There's just so much litter in there that is not getting to the reef because you've got mangroves and seagrasses. They are also <laughs> termed a nursery area. They directly support the reef fish populations. So lots of juvenile fish species will hang out in the mangroves and seagrasses where they're a bit safer than they would be on the reef until they get to a size that they can take care of themselves and then head out. So protecting mangroves and seagrasses really helps protect your reef. And then, of course, vote for legislation and support legislation that enacts these things. So this has been a um, not complete coverage. The report will be out and will be available on the CCMI website once it's published. And there are more suggestions in there depending on who you are and what your strengths are for things to do. Um, I will also be back in June, July time, so we'll be able to update some of these results and put uh, this work in the context of what CCMI is currently doing. And I'm also going to be asking you some questions about your thoughts and your experiences, and so I would really like to see you there um, if you can make it. It would be great to hear uh, what you think. Um, so. Let me say a few particular thank yous, obviously, to our project partners for their support in the field when we were serving Grand Cayman, um, to our funding agencies, the National Gallery for hosting us and our sponsors for this event, the team who helped me collect the data, put in very long hours, had a terrible boss, and um, some of those days were cold, rainy, and miserable, but they they really worked like troopers to get it all done. And finally, of course, thank you to you for coming this evening.